Okay, welcome. We might get started. Um, thanks for coming along. It's um, last week of semester for those of us who are teaching or um, in subjects. So I know it's a really intense time for a lot of us. So um, it's really good to see a lot of people here. And thanks to the Zoom audience as well. I can't see you, but um, you've been very consistent this semester. So thank you for that. Um, traditionally, the last week of semester is the last um, test seminar for the semester, but um, stay tuned because Yoko is trying to line up a special seminar for next week. So I'm um, just waiting for that to fall into place. So she'll send out the normal announcements if it is indeed going, going to go ahead. So I don't want to say too much more about that. Anyway, I don't want to take any more time from Daniel. So I'll introduce um, uh, Dr. Daniel Montesinos, who is a senior um, plant biosecurity researcher in the Australian Tropical Herbarium. So Daniel, as you would know, um, has done research in Spain and Portugal and the U.S. and has, um, you know, is our, our local expert on, um, on weeds and uh, is getting some really interesting model systems going here. Um, with student researchers, and he's going to talk to us today about one of his latest papers. And I know when he had this out, he um, in his tweet he mentioned that he'd looked up the word fastly. No, because that's a slide. <laughs> okay, I better not say anymore because it's a slide, as it turns out. Um, just wanted to. It, I think it's probably one of the most memorable titles I've read in a while. So um, yeah, I'm sure the talk will be memorable too. Thank you, Daniel. I'll get back okay. to you on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thanks for coming. Um, so Tess asked me to to suggest a, a theme, and I just have finished this uh, review that has been uh, recently published. Um, and I'm going to give you a take-home message right now, which is um, that invasive plants tend to be adapted to disturbance and to fast life cycles, which means that they grow fast, reproduce fast, and uh, just have very quick uh, life cycles. And that's, of course, not universal. It's just a trend. Mostly, many, many invasives are in this fast side of the uh, plant economic spectrum that now we'll go to explain what it is. And now, um, I find how to pass the slide. <laughs> I've been uh, said a number of times by native speakers that faster uh, was not a word in English. Does anyone share that opinion here? Does anyone have a strong opinion about whether faster is a word or not in English? I was hoping to get some revenge with this one. <laughs> so you the Collins Dictionary and the Wikipedia Wiktionary <laughs> that have them in all Justice is not in all dictionaries, but because English has no official English, uh, dictionary, uh, this is good enough. Um, as a minor uh, prize for you, I have to say that it's, it's labeled as English non-standard terms uh, in the dictionary. So uh, one for you, one for me in there. <laughs> but it is a word. I had this conversation with the journal uh, editorial board, <laughs> and they ended up accepting it. So. But going to the title, first slide, fast low, what is like, what is this thing? And when I was invited to contribute to this special issue in Journal of Ecology about a common garden experiments and the fast and slow economic spectrum of plants and climate change, um, I accepted without really knowing what it meant, I have to say. But that's a problem I have, not being able to say no. I hope you didn't share the problem with me, but this turned out well. The fast and slow plant economic spectrum is actually quite intuitive, but it's a concept that was built around the economic spectrum of the leaves of plants. Uh, and it was based on uh, specific leaf, leaf areas and how there were physiological constraints and trade-offs that determined that plants that had fast life cycles had one kind of leaves, uh, and plants with slow uh, growth cycles had another kind of leaves. Uh, and then quite recently, 2014, it was proposed that this idea, this perspective, this way to interpret physiological data or ecological data could be expanded to the entire plant and just classify plants as fast or slow metaphorically. And it's really quite intuitive and it's actually a very interesting perspective that gives uh, 
um, a fascinating way to interpret many uh, phenomena. However, uh, currently it's mostly, its use is mostly limited uh, to people with a strong physiological, clam physiology background. And many other ecologists, including most invasive ecologists, like myself, uh, don't know what it means. Uh, and the aim of this review was like, well, I think that the kind of data that we're producing when assessing invasive ability of plants uh, is the kind of data that, they will, that will fit very well into this uh, way of interpreting the data, interpreting in terms of this fast, slow economic spectrum. So that's what it means. And the aim of, of what I'm going to explain you now in more detail is that um, invasive plants are fast. When they move to the non-native range, they adapt rapidly to new conditions. And they adapt in a way that generally makes them even faster. They grow in faster, become even bigger, um, and are predicted to increase the distributions under climate change. And we'll go over that with a few interesting examples. And this is just a little review. Uh, but I think you'll find um, very interesting. One of the things that call my attention is that this fast, slow economics uh, is not just something made up. It, it really is dependent on the environmental conditions. Um, so if you see this plot, for instance, is this, the, the abundance of nitrogen is correlated the, with the lifespan. Um, I'm not sure if this is the plant or the tree, sorry, but you know, um, Plants that live long uh, tend to have or tend to experience lower levels of nitrogen. Fast plants uh, actually grow in places with a lot of nitrogen, which matches perfectly what we find on the invasives, if I'm interpreting correctly this plot, which I might not. <laughs> um, growth rates very clearly uh, and survivals after five years. Uh, plants that survive for longer, uh, definitely perennials if it's five years. Um, have slower growth rates, whereas annuals obviously uh, will die immediately uh, and will have way higher growth rates. There is, and this might be dependent on uh, the specific life area that you have, and the specific life area is highly dependent on the nitrogen that you have available in the environment. So it turns out that nutrient-rich environments are somehow through a cascading uh, through cascading effects on, on trade-offs, uh, ending up promoting uh, prevalence of plants that are aligned on the fast side of the plant economics spectrum. And, and the, the way that uh, physiologists have been able to link all this, I think is really, really enlightening, really. Uh, very interesting. So going over the, the full review, just clarifying what the plant economic spectrum is. Um, first point with a few examples. The invasives, as I said, uh, are overrepresented at the far side of the plant economic spectrum. This is one example. This is, um, this is just for UK plants. It's showing here um, how many regions uh, a species has over the world. So the more regions, the more invasive it is, so to speak, the more successful invasive. In this case, it's, it's a relative term, but generally speaking, if you've been able to establish populations in more non-native regions across the world, you will be, uh, in most cases, a more successful uh, invasive plant or animal. Uh, and of course, the ones that were more successful uh, were the ones having uh, higher growth rates, which means that they were, again, on the fast side of the plant economic spectrum. Now, this has been very rarely contextualized uh, in the area of invasive ecology, but one of the few papers that actually did is this one in which they were comparing um, uh, physiological variables comparing invasive and non-invasive species. Uh, we see, uh, in this case, is um, leaf mass area and phot photosynthetic capacity. Uh, plants uh, with higher leaf mass area, which is correlated with uh, slow growing species, uh, will tend to have a slower photosynthetic capacity. Uh, again, nitrogen concentration correlated with higher photosynthetic capacity. How this links uh, again together and for uh, alien species, they will always be on the higher side, uh, on the fastest side of this plant economic spectrum. So there is some evidence. Uh, there hasn't been a consistent review until now, and I haven't done a meta-analysis or anything. Uh, this meta-analysis is not focused on the, it's not explicitly using the terminology of the fast, slow economic spectrum, but uh, how this works is 
if uh, this value and the confidence interval is above this line, this means it's significant, and the farther it goes, um, the stronger the effect. And when you compare invasive to non-invasive, invasives have higher fitness, higher size, higher growth rates, uh, higher suit allocation, higher leaf area allocation, and higher physiology, meaning higher photosynthetic rates, photosynthetic capacity, et cetera. Um, now it's interesting to join these two concepts so we can actually understand that they really are uh, fast. I don't know why that is not, okay. <clears throat> On the same analysis, I think the, the take home message here is that for tropical climates, the effect is much stronger uh, than for others. And I, I must have cut something out, sorry. <laughs> because I, I, I don't get here in the legend what is this variable exactly, but it's the only one that is significant. And I think it's the one that is comparing tropical, the effect of the previous slide uh, on tropical versus uh, temperate climates. In the tropics, these patterns are even more significant uh, of a higher magnitude than in temperate habitats. <clears throat> again, more examples, you know, uh, nitrogen cycling. This again is not, uh, it's not assessing the plant economics spectrum specifically or explicitly, but clearly this is related to it. Um, plants, um, invasive plants result in increased uh, nitrogen pools, uh, increased above ground uh, vegetation. I don't even remember what this is. <laughs> nitrogen mineralization and, and litter. And if we go to the next one, again, we can see that this is way higher. Uh, even if this is significant, but the magnitude of this is like two or almost threefold higher in the tropics. And particularly, I think, for nitrogen cycling, this is very important. When an habitat is invaded, nitrogen cycling goes to the roof. And that only facilitates the entry of other species, which are also on the fast side on the plant economic spectrum, uh, which are able to take advantage of that increased nitrogen uh, and to thrive in that environment at the expense of the natives that might not be able to grow fast enough to benefit from this uh, increased nitrogen availability. Um, similar thing happens for islands, uh, in case you're curious. <clears throat> then the second part of the title will be rural means adapted to disturbance. A rural habitat is an habitat that is disturbed frequently. This could be a farm, a roadside, uh, it could be um, a landscape which is burned frequently. Um, any kind of disturbance entails the appearance of a plant and animal community that is adapted to these disturbances. And that's very common in areas where agriculture has been there for long. Uh, in this article, we see that they are distinguishing here in orange between naturalized uh, plant species and non-naturalized. Uh, by naturalized, they mean that non-native species have established uh, viable populations. And they might not expand or they might expand. They just didn't distinguish. But for simplicity, let's say that orange is invasives and blue is natives. And you can see that in terms of life forms, um, herbs and long-lived herbs uh, predominate in the invasives, uh, whereas there are invasives that are shrubs and trees, but proportionally, uh, there's a lower proportion of them. Again, of course, herbs, and uh, even if they're long-lived, they tend to have uh, faster life cycles. Um, and they tend to uh, be more resilient to disturbance. In this meta-analysis, they clearly tested if non-native spe non uh, species were benefiting from disturbance, and there's a clear effect. Uh, they considered several factors. Um, the ones that were clearly significant is uh, nutrient addition, which is a kind of disturbance, and it's very common in farming, but it's also occurring because of nitrogen deposition, because we're just using so many fertilizers in, in farming areas, that is actually more available nitrogen in the atmosphere, and that nitrogen is depositing in natural areas, which results in nitrification, that again is another factor that is favoring the invasion uh, by fast cycle invasive plants. And clearly is one of the disturbance types that has a, a highest magnitude effect together with grazing and any kind of anthropogenic disturbance is correlated uh, with uh, the appearance of invasive species. And of course, when invasive species get into an habitat, 
non-native diversity and abundance is significantly higher, whereas the native diversity and abundance is not significantly lower. Uh, but clearly, the dynamics are favoring the non-natives in the long run. So disturbance has this, it's a two-edged sword, and it's bad on both sides. It's, fair, it's first creating habitats that are more prone to be invaded because they have ideal conditions for these uh, fast life cycle species to be introduced. And at the same time, we do know that the propagules of the invasive species are being introduced with the same machines, cars, rows that are being opened in the forest and they're bringing these seeds to these freshly disturbed habitats with lots of nitrogen available where they can thrive. And so they're really, they really, really go hand on hand and it's not surprising that disturbance is really the main vector for, for invasive species to get into habitats. Many well-established habitats will be quite resistant to disturbance, uh, to invasion, sorry, if there is no disturbance. Once we start having disturbances, that's the edge of the sword where invasive species are getting into the habitat, promoting more disturbance, expanding furthermore, etc. Um, another interesting um, finding during the lead review I did is that an overwhelming proportion of invasive plants over the world are native to Europe. And this might, of course, be influenced by historical factors and the colonial past. But it might have to be also uh, had to do also with perhaps uh, the abundance of disturbance in European habitats. This has been high population density um, and a long history of farming that might have not been as common in other parts of America or Australia, for instance. Uh, not that they were no farming, but not as important probably. Um, and you can see here just uh, a number of different habitats. Uh, but essentially, a take-home message from this article to me was very important: is that Gosh, European plants are everywhere, and they tend maybe not so much in the tropics. We we might be on the safe side in that in that part, but everywhere else in temperate habitats, they really are predominantly the origin of most uh, biological invasions of most plant biological invasions. Um, <clears throat> this is a recent article: um, scientists warning about uh, invasive species. You've seen other similar warning articles, uh, which are promoted from the same uh, group of scientists. Um, you can see here for different groups how invasives are just uh, going up, and it's not it's not coincidental that this uh, correlates with an increase in disturbance of natural habitats. Uh, we've seen in previous talks, text talks, I think you gave one in which you were showing us how disturbance and road expansion was increasing, probably following a very similar pattern to the one that we're showing here. Um, and it's not surprising that all these plants and animals are just expanding. Uh, in parallel with the disturbance. Um, I'm not gonna go in depth into this, but let's just say <laughs> that, <clears throat> of course, there are levels of disturbance that may be even too much for some species, but the generally speaking, uh, modeling confirms that disturbance uh, is a critical factor. And it ha there, there is experimental proof that many species are actually not able to establish um, viable populations in the absence of repeated disturbance. But if you think about it, a grazing farm is actually a repeated disturbance habitat. And there's no surprise that many foreign grasses are just expanding and thriving in there. <clears throat> now we go to the next phase, fast become faster. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you might have seen other talks by me and I don't want to reuse my own slides too much. Um, but invasive species are known to develop rapid adaptations very quickly. Um, I like this figure because it's showing you the number of studies that is telling you the upper bound for years sufficient for at least some evolutionary adaptive change to be recorded. And for a high number of studies, it's less than 50 years. For some, the evidence comes only after 300 years, but you can see that like probably more than 50% uh, of the studies, including this uh, review, uh, need less than 100 years for adaptive uh, evolutionary changes to occur when plants are introduced into a new region with, with different uh, environmental conditions, they actually shift their trade-offs. There are many explanations for this. One of them is that, <coughs> excuse me, the most well-known one is that you escape from herbivores or other kind of pathogens that are only present in the native range. When you're introducing the non-native range, 
And not having those uh, pathogens or herbivores release a lot of resources that you were previously allocating to chemical defenses, for instance, or spines, to, for instance, increase photosynthetic systems, uh, increase growth, increase competitive ability, and that gives you an advantage in that non-native range because you don't have natural enemies there, or you only have generalist enemies, but not specialist enemies. Um, and apologies for this plot, it's where it came in the paper. <laughs> but just the take home message is when they do actually, and this is an Australian study, um, when they did this for a number of species native to several places, uh, I think the um, blue ones are the native range uh, for several traits, and the yellow ones are the non native ranges. Uh, the asterisks are indicating significant differences. And we're seeing, for instance, that herbivory is higher in the native than in the non native ranges for these species. Uh, if we go to another figure, um, this is separating for, for different regions, but here leaf area is higher in the non-native uh, than in the native. Um, again, rapid adaptive changes, and this is in common garden uh, experiments in which they're controlling for environment. Uh, so what they're measuring here, it's allegedly mostly uh, genetic based and adaptive and not just the consequence of maternal effects. And there are so many examples I'm not, I'm not going to um, go through a, a big array of them. I avoided using my own examples this time. Uh, but uh, this meta-analysis just proves very clearly, you know, uh, clear increase in reproductive traits. And this is almost significant below ground vegetative growth, um, et cetera. The overall effect, uh, clearly significant when you compare um, uh, invasives uh, versus natives, uh, the invasives have shifted their traits. Oh no, excuse me, this is a comparison of the same of the same species, individuals from the native range and individuals from the non-native range of the same species that have evolved towards um, having higher biomass uh, and higher growth and faster reproductive cycles in the non-native range than their conspecifics from the native range. And this might have happened, and this is a meta-analysis, but as we saw, this might have happened in, in, in as little as 50 years and in as much as maybe 200 years since introduction. And now wrapping up uh, the talk, I think the message is clear that invasives are rapid, that they're becoming even more rapid when they're introduced into other habitats. But the interesting thing of invasives is that they're very good in uh, study systems to understand that will happen to natives. And this is particularly relevant uh, when we're thinking about climate change. Because if you think about it, when uh, an invasive plant is introduced into a non-native region, they are experiencing a different climate. It might not be radically different. Uh, maybe it will be a very similar climate and it will be just the community uh, that is interacting with it, which is different. But in many, many cases, the climate is actually very different. And in fact, uh, and this is, I think this is 2021, uh, this paper just came out saying climatic sh uh, night shifts are common in introduced plants. And you can see here, and I think this is kind of cartoonish, but this is, according to these two variables, precipitation and temperature, um, this is the environmental, these are the environmental conditions experienced by the species in their native range. And this will be the shifted environmental conditions that they're experiencing in their non-native range. And this, I don't remember exactly, but some of them are the realized niche and the potential niche and blah, blah, blah. And it can get quite complex, but very simply, their niche has shifted when they're introduced in the non-native range, and they've been able to adapt to it. Uh, and if you're curious about um, geography and how this goes, I find this interesting because Africa gets their column, North America and South America are divided by two, but then Australasia and Eurasia, we're all sharing Asia here. I don't know really well how this works, but, <laughs> but you can see that the red one is showing you uh, the niche overlap between native and non-native, and you can see that actually the niche overlap uh, in many cases is less than half. Like they're actually shifting niches uh, very significantly uh, in the non-native ranges. Then this other article tells us, look, we do know this of invasives because we've been studying invasives a lot, and we've been studying under which conditions they're able to thrive, and so we're understanding this very well. But it turns out that natives, of course, are adapting all the time too. She says that we don't have as much evidence because it's very difficult to know how long it took to this plant to adapt locally because we don't know the introduction date. Uh, 
Whereas with invasives, we usually have some, at least some general idea. It was introduced 100 years ago. If it's Australian and it comes from Europe, it should be, you know, roughly 200 and something years ago at, at, at most. Um, but when we do studies with natives, we do find that natives actually are adapting all the time. This tells us that it inv if invasives are being able to adapt to these very different climates, natives may be able to do too, or at least some of them. And this has important consequences for climate change, for predicting what's going to happen uh, with our habitats, and maybe to make more informed decisions uh, when managing uh, uh, habitat conservation and restoration in the face of climate change. Um, the conceptual fra framework is simple. Th this is the native range of a species. Uh, this is unsuitable because of environmental change. Then suddenly there is a nearly suitable habitats uh, and some of it is colonized by the species. Um, so with time, we're expecting that we were here, we have all native species, we start having alien species, and then we're, we should expect to have neonative species. These neonative species will be native species that are shifting their ranges and maybe displacing other native species that may not be able to migrate as quickly as these do. And in animals, they will be uh, a little more intuitive, but, but in plants, they, this can be dramatic. You can have a native species migrating to the mountain tops, for instance, in the uh, project that Darren and others at the herbarium uh, are developing. Uh, and it's not invasive species that are displacing plants from the mountain top uh, and making them disappear. It's other natives. It's, it's these neonatives that they call here. And they even go as far as to name Archaea, Biora, and Neobiora uh, to distinguish between alien species that have been there for long and have actually developed local adaptations and the ones that, are, that will uh, massively uh, increase their abundance uh, when climate change makes everything uh, more suitable for them. And there is an example here with deer, uh, more animal friendly. I think this is the only slide with an animal in this presentation. <laughs> uh, but this is an example of North America of, of native uh, animals migrating north because of climate change, but eventually displacing some of the species that might not be able to migrate uh, farther north. And there are some traits here that they developed uh, as a risk assessment on the same article. Uh, of course, if you go to the high risk uh, traits that can be identified on a species that could become harmful, uh, they tend to be associated with uh, the fast side of the plant economics spectrum, or in this case, it could be even uh, with the animal economics spectrum. As far as I know, no one is using that term in animal ecology, but I think it could be an interesting concept to explore. So wrapping up, um, invasives align with the fast side of the plant economic spectrum, mostly. Of course, there are numerous uh, and notable ex exceptions, including wood invasives uh, are all across the board. Um, wood invasives uh, that are faster uh, are not particularly more invasive than the, than the, other, the ones that are not. Um, invasive are adapted to rural disturbed habitats uh, in their native range. The native range is very frequently Europe, uh, at least out of the tropics, um, and they are able to rapidly adapt to new local conditions. Uh, and they adapt towards being even faster, which will still provide them with more benefits uh, with climate change. Still disturbance uh, is, if I had to highlight one factor that will be the worst contributor to biological invasions, it will be disturbance. Uh, if there is a managing intervention to control invasive species or the spread uh, of them, it will be to control disturbance, really, as much as we can. And um, invasives are good model systems uh, for other species. We can learn a lot about all the research that we've done already, and that can help us predict what's going to happen uh, with the native species. I don't think all native species will be able to adapt to climate change, but at least some of them, we can infer quite clearly that they will actually be able to reasonably migrate and adapt to the new conditions if they're not uh, too fast. And that's all for today. Thank you. I'm not sure what time is it. <laughs>